Um, the loosely unifying theme for this morning's webinar is uh, what's my claim worth? And uh, with an eye on that brief, I'm going to kick things off uh, by considering a couple of situations where your claim uh, could be worth nothing. Uh, specifically, I wanted to look at uh, two recent Supreme Court decisions that are of considerable relevance uh, to all professional negligence litigators. Um, first, uh, Manchester Building Society and Grant Thornton, and then Matthew and Sedman, um, both consider particular hurdles that claimants need to surmount uh, before they can get any potential claim uh, off the ground in the first place. Uh, Elizabeth is then going to examine some ways in which even if your claim is basically good, uh, it could still be cut down and your damages reduced, uh, particularly in consequence of contractual exclusion uh, and limitation clauses, or uh, also statute, uh, with some examples from the pensions field. And then uh, Wendy is going to wrap things up by talking us through some ways to go about valuing what you've lost uh, in difficult cases um, and clawing back damages which might otherwise be unrecoverable as a result of limitation, uh, looking specifically at loss for chance claims, again, with a particular reference to uh, pension schemes. So if you've got um, any questions as we go along, uh, please do pop them uh, in the chat for Q&A. Um, we'll see how things uh, progress. And if we've got time at the end, uh, we'll do our best uh, to answer some. So um, Manchester Building Society and Grant Thornton, uh, the latest uh, and now the leading uh, consideration of the Samco principle governing the scope of a professional advisor's duty and the consequent extent of uh, his or her liability in negligence. I should uh, probably mention at the outset that the judgment uh, should be read together with that in Khan and Meadows, uh, an appeal uh, in a clinical negligence case, which was heard by the same panel of the Supreme Court. Um, but given uh, time constraints uh, this morning, I'm just going to focus uh, on Manchester Building Society. So uh, to summarise the factual background very briefly and uh, necessarily simplistically, uh, Grant Thornton was engaged uh, by Manchester Building Society uh, as its auditor. In 2006, uh, Grant Thornton negligently advised the society that it could apply hedge accounting to its accounts and that the accounts prepared using uh, that method gave a true and fair view of the society's financial position. In uh, reliance on that advice, the society carried on a strategy uh, of entering into long-term interest rate swap contracts as a hedge against the cost of borrowing money to fund uh, mortgage lending. Some seven years later, Grant Thornton realised that their advice uh, was wrong. The society was not, in fact, able to use hedge accounting because the hedging strategy it had adopted, and of which Grant Thornton had been aware, uh, was insufficiently effective. The society accordingly had to restate its accounts to show substantially reduced net assets, so also revealing uh, inadequate regulatory capital. And to extricate itself from this predicament, the society was obliged to close out the swaps at a cost of some £33 million. Pounds. The question on the appeal was whether these costs were recoverable by the society from Grant Thornton by way of damages. Uh, negligence having been admitted, the primary point at issue was whether Grant Thornton owed a duty to the society to protect it from the losses it had incurred. And that question, in turn, uh, required consideration of the principle articulated in South Australia Asset Management Corporation and York Montague, uh, the Samco case from 1997. So Samco itself concerned a group of claims again brought by mortgage lenders, uh, but this time against valuers who had negligently overvalued properties mortgaged as security for loans on which the borrowers had defaulted. And the question the court had to consider was whether the lenders could recover from the valuers the full financial loss they'd suffered as a result of making the loans in reliance on the valuations, or whether damages should be limited to reflect the fact that the lenders' losses were partly attributable to a fall in the property market. Now, uh, the principle established by the court in response to this question has proved uh, difficult both to formulate and to apply. 
Uh, but one way of summarizing it would be to say that a professional advisor is only liable for losses which are within the scope of his or her duty of care. Uh, Lord Hoffman in Samco explained this by positing the uh, now famous example of a doctor who negligently advises a mountaineer about to undertake a difficult climb that his knee uh, is fit for the task. And the mountaineer goes on the climb, which he wouldn't have undertaken if the doctor had told him the true state of his knee, uh, and suffers an injury, which, uh, in Lord Hoffman's words, is an entirely foreseeable consequence of mountaineering, but has nothing to do with his knee. Uh, Lord Hoffman reasoned that the doctor is not liable for the injury because he said the injury has not been caused by the doctor's bad advice. Uh, on the contrary, uh, the injury would have occurred even if the advice had been correct. So uh, Lord Hoffman went on uh, to generalise uh, this reasoning in uh, the following terms. Uh, a person, uh, he said, uh, under a duty to take reasonable care to provide information on which someone else will decide on a course of action is if negligent, not generally regarded as responsible for all the consequences of that course of action. He is responsible only for the consequences of the information being wrong. A duty of care which imposes upon the informant responsibility for losses which would have occurred even if the information which he gave had been correct uh, is not, in my view, uh, fair and reasonable as between the parties. Uh, so uh, the underlying policy rationale for this uh, was articulated by uh, Lord Nichols of Birkenhead uh, in Nye Credit Mortgage Bank and Edward Erkman Group uh, when the House of Lords dealt with the question of the interest payable on the damages uh, that were awarded in Samco. Uh, so Lord Nichols explained that a defendant valuer isn't liable for all the consequences which flow from the lender entering into the transaction. Uh, he's not even liable for all the foreseeable consequences he is not liable for consequences which would have arisen even if the advice had been correct. He's not liable for these because they are the consequences of risks the lender would have taken upon himself if the valuation advice had been sound. As such, they are not within the scope of the duty owed to the lender by the valuer. Um, there are two particular features of uh, the Samco judgment which warrant emphasis. Uh, first, the distinction Lord Hoffman was at pains to draw between, on the one hand, uh, advice cases and, on the other, information cases. Um, according to this distinction, where the professional's duty is simply to provide information, he will be liable only for the foreseeable financial consequences of that information being wrong. Uh, where, by contrast, the professional's duty is to advise uh, whether a course of action should be taken and he advises negligently, he will be liable for all the foreseeable loss, which is a consequence of that course of action having been adopted. Uh, now, this dichotomy obviously has uh, its limitations. Uh, on the one hand, uh, as Lord Sumption acknowledged in Hughes Holland and BPE solicitors, uh, information given by a professional to a client is usually a specific form of, of advice. Um, and on the other hand, most advice uh, is going to involve conveying information. So uh, neither label really corresponds to the contents of the bottle. Uh, the second uh, problematic feature of Lord Hoffman's analysis in Samco is its promotion of a counterfactual test uh, as a way of identifying the loss for which a negligent provider of uh, information is responsible uh, by asking the question, would the loss suffered by the claimant have occurred even if the information provided by the defendant uh, being correct? Now, if such loss would have occurred, uh, it falls outside the scope of the professional's duty. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, the application of this text in practice uh, can lead to the deployment of um, somewhat abstruse arguments about how the counterfactual world uh, should be conceived. And as was noted uh, in the Manchester Building Society case, uh, the more complicated the factual circumstances at issue, the easier it is for the counterfactual worlds conjured up by the party's lawyers uh, to become divorced from reality. So um, with all that in mind, how did the courts approach the scope of duty question in Manchester Building Society? Well, uh, applying the Samco principle, the judge at first instance held that Grant Thornton was not liable for the 33 million 
because he said it had not assumed responsibility uh, for the type of loss in question and that looking at matters in the round, the losses uh, were the result of market forces. Now, the Court of Appeal uh, dismissed the Society's appeal against that decision, uh, but differed from the trial judge in its reasoning. Um, Lord Justice Hamblin, as he then was, uh, who gave the leading judgment, held that this was an information, not an advice case, and that the Society couldn't satisfy the burden of proof in relation to the Samco counterfactual. Um, it, in other words, the Society was unable uh, to prove that it would have been better off if it had continued to hold the swaps. The Supreme Court uh, approached the issue differently again. Uh, although uh, Lord Legat and Lord Burroughs gave their own judgments, uh, some aspects of the reasoning of which differed from the majority, uh, the court was unanimous in allowing the appeal. And in doing so, the majority uh, judgment given by uh, Lord Hodge and Lord Sales emphasized that in identifying the scope of a professional's duty of care, the crucial question is the purpose of the duty. Um, and that purpose is to be judged objectively by reference to the purpose for which the advice is being given. Uh, in Manchester Building Society's case, the purpose of Grant Thornton's advice uh, was clear. Uh, as Lord Hodge and Lord Hale uh, Sales summarised it, um, the Society looked to Grant Thornton for technical accounting advice, whether it could use hedge accounting uh, in order to implement its proposed business model uh, within the constraints arising by virtue of the regulatory environment. And Grant Thornton advised that it could. That advice was negligent. Uh, it had the effect that the Society adopted the business model, entered into further swap transactions, and was exposed to the risk of loss from having to break the swaps when it was realized that hedge accounting could not in fact be used and the society was exposed to the regulatory capital demands which the use of hedge accounting was supposed to avoid. That was a risk uh, which Grant Thornton's advice was supposed to allow the society to assess and which their negligence caused the society to fail to understand. Uh, it's a quote from paragraph 34 of the judgment. So in, in other words, the purpose uh, of Grant Thornton's advice, uh, and hence its duty, was to enable the society to know whether there was an effective hedging relationship between the swaps and the mortgages that the society had entered into, and hence whether hedge accounting could be used. Uh, the foreseeable consequences of Grant Thornton's advice being wrong, uh, those consequences being the society's losses on having to break the swaps, therefore fell to be borne by Grant Thornton. There was, uh, though, a sting uh, in the tail. The Supreme Court uh, also unanimously held that the society had contributed to its loss by being overly ambitious in its attempt to match mortgages and swaps, and that its recoverable damages were therefore to be reduced by 50%. So um, what are the implications of the Supreme Court's analysis? Um, well, uh, no doubt this is something that's going to be discussed and debated and worked out uh, in detail um, over months and uh, years to come. But given uh, time constraints, um, there are three uh, particular aspects that I'd like uh, to emphasize today. First, um, and as we have already seen, uh, the emphasis of the uh, majority on the purpose of a professional's advice as the essential means of identifying the scope of his or her duty is, I think, uh, helpful. Uh, and may well go some way towards mitigating the difficulty and confusion uh, that's often arisen in applying uh, the SAMCO principle in the past. Uh, in simple terms, uh, one looks to see what risk the professional's duty was supposed to guard against, and then looks to see whether the loss suffered represents the fruition of that risk. Uh, this isn't, um, it seems to me, uh, a departure from SAMCO, uh, but, but rather the, the very point uh, of the mountaineer's knee example given uh, by Lord Hoffman. Um, second, and leading on uh, from, from that first point, is, is the majority's deprecation of the distinction between advice uh, and information. Um, as Lord Hodge and Lord Sales emphasised, uh, the distinction is too rigid uh, and as such is liable to mislead. Um, in, in future, uh, therefore, rather than starting with the distinction between advice and information, uh, practitioners uh, are going to need to focus on identifying the matters on which the professional has undertaken to advise, 
uh, and in light of those matters, the risks against which the professional has undertaken to protect the client. Indeed, um, Lord Legat expressed the firm view that the terms information and advice should be dispensed with uh, as terms of art in this area altogether. Uh, third, and similarly, a counterfactual analysis should also be subordinate to the question of the purpose of the professional's duty uh, of care. Uh, the counterfactual test may be regarded as a useful cross-check, uh, but it shouldn't replace the decision uh, that needs to be made as to the scope of the duty of care. Uh, Lord Hodge, uh, Lord Sales, Lord Leggett and Lord Burroughs all emphasised that there is no need to apply a counterfactual test to arrive at the correct conclusion uh, and that the test has the potential to confuse uh, rather than assist the correct analysis. So um, that uh, is uh, a whistle stop tour of the Manchester Building Society case. Um, for the purposes of today, uh, of course, it, it's an important reminder that if as a claimant, you fail to demonstrate that your loss fell within the scope of the defendant's duty, uh, then your claim won't even get out of the starting blocks. Um, and in, in that regard, um, I think it will be it will be interesting to see uh, whether the Supreme Court's um, streamlined interpretation of Samco will, in future, uh, perhaps uh, make life slightly easier for claimants. Um, on the flip side, uh, it certainly emphasises the importance of professionals carefully documenting in their client retainer uh, the purpose for which their services are provided and hence the scope of their duty of care. Um, okay, so in the short time that I've got uh, remaining, um, I'd like to turn from uh, the intricacies of Samco to the perils of limitation, uh, another potential hurdle which uh, clearly if you don't surmount is going to result in your claim being worth uh, nothing and an area in which the Supreme Court has also uh, very recently given judgment in the case of Matthew and Sedman. Uh, concerning the issue of midnight deadlines, um, although um, addressing what's in one sense quite a narrow point, um, as it tends to be the question with judgments on um, fiddly uh, limitation questions, the decision does serve as a salutary reminder of the importance of issuing uh, proceedings in good time um, where possible. Um, so by way of very brief uh, summary of the facts. Uh, the claimants uh, in Matthews and Seventh were the trustees of a will trust um, on Monday, the 5th of June 2017. Uh, they issued a claim uh, in negligence against the trust's former professional trustees uh, on the ground that uh, they, um, the, the defendant trustees, uh, had failed to make a claim on behalf of the trust under a uh, court sanctioned scheme of arrangement by the scheme deadline of midnight uh, on the 2nd of June 2011. And the defendants uh, applied for summary judgment, um, arguing that because the claim was issued on Monday the 5th of June 2017, it had been brought outside the prescribed uh, six-year limitation period. So the question before the court uh, was whether or not when the cause of action commences at the stroke of midnight, the following day is to be included in calculating the applicable limitation period. Uh, the claimants contended that the cause of action uh, was to be treated as having accrued partway through the 3rd of June 2011, uh, so the day after the scheme deadline, uh, that this day uh, was therefore not to be counted for limitation purposes, uh, that the limitation period had accordingly expired on Saturday the 3rd of June 2017, and hence that the claim had been brought in time, Monday the 5th of June 2017 being the first following working day. Now, both the trial judge and the Court of Appeal held that the 3rd of June uh, was to be included in the limitation period, and hence uh, that the claimants were, were out of time. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, then unanimously uh, dismissed the claimants further appeal. Um, just a couple of important points from uh, the leading judgment of Lord Stevens. Um, first, the court uh, acknowledged uh, the general rule that uh, the day of accrual of a cause of action should be excluded uh, from the reckoning of a limitation period on the basis uh, that the law rejects a fraction of a day. Uh, this approach uh, prevents part of a day being counted as a whole day 
for the purposes uh, of a limitation period. Um, otherwise, uh, if uh, parts of a day were included, uh, the time periods laid back by statute uh, would be reduced and claimants uh, would consequently be uh, prejudiced. Uh, but secondly, uh, the court emphasized uh, that the justification relating to fractions of a day did not apply uh, to midnight deadline cases. Um, the reason being that whether the cause of action uh, was held to have accrued at the very end of one day or at the very start of the next, uh, the day which commenced immediately after accrual was a complete and undivided day. So uh, the court concluded that the whole day which followed um, the midnight deadline, in this case, the 3rd of June 2011, uh, was to be included uh, in the computation of the limitation period and uh, therefore that the claimants uh, had issued their claim uh, out of time. So that uh, in, in extremely compressed form is Matthews and Sedman, uh, quite uh, an interesting, um, almost uh, metaphysical question uh, at issue. Um, and although of fairly specific application, uh, an important case to keep in mind, I think, uh, both for what it says about midnight deadlines uh, and as a more general reminder not to get caught out by limitation and the various uh, stumbling blocks which inevitably arise when claims are issued at the last minute. Um, um, I'm going to pass the bat on to Elizabeth, uh, who is going to turn our attention to exclusion and uh, limitation clauses. Uh, Elizabeth. With the helpful introduction, what's my claim worth? Perhaps less than you thought. So we're looking at situations where the claimant has established the existence of a duty of care. They've got over Henry's first hurdle, applying general principles. Uh, whatever has gone wrong is in the, within the scope of the professional's duty. But there are some obstacles in the way of the claimant's progress to a substantial award of damages. And I shall be looking primarily about uh, at contractual terms, but also commenting very briefly on the Limitation Act 1980, which should then lead seamlessly into Wendy's final talk. So contractual provisions and notices. I'm going to look at four types of provisions that I have had to consider recently. Contractual provisions, of course, very useful for the defendant faced with a claim by the other party to the contract, but they may also have a bearing on claims by the third party. And in the occupational pensions field, it's common to find, for example, that trustees have a contract with the actuary to provide actuarial services, including carrying out scheme valuations or otherwise advising on scheme liabilities. But in practice, the employer also relies on the actuary's advice. And that sort of third party reliance on professional advice may also arise, uh, as we all know, in relation to professional activities such as the preparation of company accounts, valuation of properties and many other matters. And it's not uncommon to see contractual provisions directed at potential third party liabilities, as well as liabilities to the other contracting party. And I shall be looking at that sort of situation here, as well as the straightforward two party situation. So as I say, the ones I've had to consider recently include provisions excluding liability for negligence, either by way of direct contractual term or by way of purported notice to a third party, provisions excluding liability for indirect or consequential loss, provisions limiting liability, including liability to third parties, and provisions indemnifying the defendant in respect of claims by third parties. So a few brief thoughts about each of those categories. Excluding liability for negligence. Well, of course, a contractual provision may purport to exclude liability to the other contracting party or to a third party. No doubt it's rare to have a total exclusion clause in the realm of professional services, not least because professional obligations require professionals to have insurance in place. And we are all only too familiar 
with our professional requirements. You're much more likely to find a provision limiting liability, but liability to third parties can be a different matter. I've seen contractual provisions purporting to exclude liabilities to third parties, backed up by additional contractual provisions to the effect that the advice given is confidential, can only be disclosed with permission, and if disclosed, must be disclosed in a manner which makes clear the basis of disclosure. So in the pensions context, disclosure to the employer of actuarial advice given to trustees may be permitted, but on terms which seek to exclude liability to the employer, even where there's an obvious expectation that the employer will seek to rely on it. And in a similar vein, um, and as we all see ever increasing numbers of PowerPoint presentations, I've seen presentation slides for presentations to employers and trustees jointly, but with a disclaimer of third party liability at the end of the presentation. Well, the law applying both to contractual provisions and notices is broadly the same, uh, whichever way the exclusion is attempted to be made. If the contract was made or the notice was given or communicated before the 1st of October 2015, then the claimant must turn to Section 2 of the Unfair Contract Terms Act. Uh, liability for death or personal injury simply cannot be excluded, but it is possible to rely on the exclusion of other liability only if the term or notice satisfies the requirement of reasonableness. And that is explained in, sub, in section 11. Was the term a fair and reasonable one to be included, having regard to the circumstances which were or ought reasonably to have been known to the parties or in their contemplation when the contract was made? Alternatively, is it fair and reasonable to allow reliance on the notice having regard to the circumstances when the liability arose or but for the notice would have arisen. And it is for those claiming that the term or notice satisfies the requirement of reasonableness to show that it does. This is of course an excellent piece of litigation for litigators, of legislation for litigators, um, because it enables a very large number of arguments to be raised taking into account very large numbers of circumstances. On or after the 1st of October 2015, the initial question is whether the contract is a consumer contract or a consumer notice. Assuming that it is, it's still not possible to exclude liability for death or personal injury. And a term or notice is not binding if it's unfair. Does the term or notice, contrary to the requirement of good faith, create a significant imbalance in the party's rights and obligations to the detriment of the consumer? Obviously, that's a slightly different test from the requirement of reasonableness. Um, it's derived from the unfair terms and consumer contracts regulations, which in turn was based on European law. So it does have something of a European flavour, but there's, again, plenty of scope for argument about the effect of any exclusion clause. And if the clause or term is not a consumer contract or consumer notice, then the Unfair Contract Terms Act still applies. Moving on then to how you tell whether it is a consumer contract or consumer notice, um, we find the relevant definitions in the Consumer Rights Act, which is applied by the Unfair Contract Terms Act for this purpose. A contract is a consumer contract if it's uh, between a consumer and a trader. A notice is a consumer notice if it's given to a consumer by a trader. A consumer is an individual acting for purposes wholly or mainly outside his trade, business, craft or profession. A trader, conversely, 
is a person acting for the purposes of his trade, business, craft or profession, whether or not through another person. In theory, this raises some interesting questions about unincorporated bodies composed of individuals, such as trustee boards, committees of management. Uh, in practice, I rather suspect that it would be thought anomalous if a trustee body or a committee of management doing the very thing for which it was constituted, managing the affairs of the trust or the body, um, is found to be a consumer. So uh, I suspect that consumer protection will not apply, but I'm not aware of any decision covering that. Moving on to liability for indirect or consequential loss, um, it's again not uncommon to find attempts to exclude losses falling within the second limb of Hadley and Baxendale, losses which are not the direct and natural consequence of the breach, but may reasonably be supposed to have been in the contemplation of the parties. And under this head, it's sometimes attempted to exclude liability for loss of profit, business interruption losses, or the cost of management time, matters of that nature. Here it's a question of construction. Does the clause cover the particular losses which are referred to? And the cases were recently discussed in considerable detail in Two Entertain Video Limited and Sony. And uh, you will find there all you want to know about direct and indirect consequential losses. Uh, it was a case concerning arson as a result of which a warehouse and its contents were destroyed. The defendants were the owners and occupiers of the warehouse and were found to have been in breach of duties of care relating to security. The loss of profit and business interruption losses suffered by the owners of the contents were found to have been direct rather than consequential losses. The goods were destroyed and loss of profit and business interruption losses naturally followed. But it is going to be yet another um, fact specific issue. Limiting liability. Well, prima facie, uh, a limitation clause will be valid against the contracting party and one would think not binding on the third party who has uh, not been party to the contract. But that may not be quite as simple as it seems. If the contract is a consumer contract, there may be a question whether the term is unfair. And the Consumer Rights Act gives us an example of uh, a potentially unfair term a term which inappropriately excludes or limits the legal rights of the consumer in the event of inadequate performance by the trader of contractual obligations. If we take an extreme case and without regard to any professional obligations which might come into play, if a consumer instructs a chartered surveyor to carry out a full valuation of a potential purchase in the sum of half a million pounds, would a liability limit of £250 create a significant imbalance in the rights of the party? If I were a consumer, I would certainly say yes. It's completely disproportionate uh, and it does not take into account who is likely to be able to insure against the risk. So there may be a bit of a question mark there. Conversely, can the third party be bound by the limitation? Well, generally speaking, it's thought not. And uh, in professional negligence textbooks, that's the answer that one will find. I won't go into detail uh, on the points raised in White and Jones, which might suggest arguments in favor of a different conclusion. Uh, as you can see from the slide, there are various dicta which may be of interest, but they do proceed on the basis very much that it's a situation where the testator 
the contracting party will not suffer loss because he will have died and will not be concerned with what happens after his death and his estate uh, does not lose any money. The disappointed beneficiary, however, plainly does suffer the potential loss. So how would those dicta apply where both the contracting party and the third party have their own claims, but it's only the contracting party's claim which is apparently subject to limitation? Uh, I don't offer any answers at all to that, but it may be an interesting area for consideration. And finally, in relation to contractual provisions, indemnity provisions. Under the Unfair Contract Terms Act, Section 4, a person dealing as a consumer could not be obliged to indemnify the other contracting party against the third party liability unless that contractual term satisfied the requirement of reasonableness. That was repealed by the Consumer Rights Act, Section 62, uh, obviously on the footing one would think that such a term might be thought to be unfair. However, uh, this does only apply uh, if a person is dealing as a consumer. Uh, for Section 4 purposes, that means neither makes the contract in the course of a business nor holds himself or herself out as doing so, and that the other party does make the contract in the course of a business. So again, it's a situation where uh, the position may be similar, whether it's uh, under the Unfair Contract Terms Act or the Consumer Rights Act. So, on the footing that in many cases we will not be looking at dealing as a consumer on the part of the would-be claimant, it may be that these clauses are effective. But obviously there is then a potential deterrent effect for the third party if it's connected in any way with the con contracting party as again may well be the case in the trustee and employer situation affecting pension schemes. Is there, from the contracting party's point of view, a possible ratchet argument that the contracting party's own loss will be increased by any liability to pay an indemnity in respect of loss caused to the third party? Are we going around in ever decreasing circles? Moving on to the Limitation Act and very conscious that Wendy needs her fair allocation of time. Uh, I'm just going to make three very brief points. I'm not saying anything about primary limitation periods. I'm just going to comment on uh, three points relating to the alternative limitation period in section 14A looking at whose knowledge is relevant, whether there can be a preliminary state of knowledge, and what you might call halfway house knowledge. Under the heading whose knowledge, I'm just offering a quick reminder that you cannot stitch together the knowledge possessed by various of the, of the, the claimants, officers and employees. On the other hand, knowledge of a responsible person is sufficient. It doesn't have to be of, say, a company board or a particular division within a company if it's a responsible person. A slight qualification to the not stitching together principle, which was considered in the 3M United Kingdom case, is that although you can't necessarily aggregate knowledge possessed by individuals, if it is reasonable to suppose that in fact, within the company, the knowledge would have been aggregated, the situation may be different. Preliminary knowledge, knowledge that there's a question mark, not necessarily knowledge that there is a real problem. So for example, in the pensions context, uh, a new actuary or a new administrator takes over uh, activities, 
they may have queries about how the benefits are calculated, may raise them with uh, internal administration or with the trustees. Uh, how are the benefits calculated? The fact that a query has arisen doesn't necessarily show that there's a real construction issue or a real problem of any kind. That may be substantially further down the line. So there are some fine lines and distinctions to be drawn here. And finally, halfway house knowledge, a partial limitation defense. The professional fails to notice the point on the first occasion when it's relevant, fails again to notice it on subsequent occasions. Assuming a new duty arose on later occasions, but there has been a certain delay by the claimant in pursuing a claim, which is not unknown to many of us, knowledge may be acquired for Section 14a purposes, which gives a limitation defence in respect of the first occasion, but not later occasions. And of course, a similar situation could arise when a claim relating to the first occasion is barred by Section 14b. What is then the effect on quantum? And I'm happy to say that it's not me who will tell you the answer. It's over to Wendy at this point. Um, I am going to uh, effectively do a, a talk of two halves for the remaining uh, talk. First, I'll be carrying on from where Elizabeth left off, uh, looking at some points uh, and ways to articulate a claim where there's been a long interval between the negligent advice and a claim and what we can do to overcome those hurdles. And then we'll get into the some of the mathsy bits, looking at some of the recent case law on the mechanics of valuing a loss of the chance claim. So in Shortino and Beaumont, the Court of Appeal had to consider the date when a cause of action accrued against a barrister who had advised on two separate occasions about the same issue. Was there one cause of action arising when the advice was first acted, acting upon? Um, a barrister advised twice on the same issue. Um, he advised once on the 4th of May 2011 when he initially settled a notice of appeal. The case was about a uh, bankrupt, ultimately the claimant in the Profneg claim, uh, appealing his trustee in bankruptcy's order for possession and sale. The defendant barrister gave the advice. His advice included a very controversial point relating to the revesting provisions in the Insolvency Act, which I'm not going to trouble you with, but form the basis of the allegation of negligence. He settled this appellant's notice in May 2011 on the first uh, occasion and advised that the novel point had reasonable prospects of success. On the 26th of October 2011, following receipt of the respondent's notice, the defendant barrister reiterated his views, saying that there were reasonable prospects of success in the appeal in the order of 55 to 60%. The judge who heard the appeal gave the argument on revesting very short shrift. The claim was issued on the 25th of October 2017, and calling back to Henry's talk, this was very much leaving it till the last minute, but it was just within limitation for the second advice. It was conceded that the May advice was statute barred, but it was implicit that the claimant was alleging that the October advice was itself alone causative of loss, even though all it did was effectively reiterate the earlier advice. So the Court of Appeal considered the decision in um, St Anselm development and slaughter in May, which was a slightly different case in that there were two separate sets of instructions in, in respect of two separate leases in circumstances where the same negligence that was uh, effected in the first, in carrying out the first set of instructions, a claim in respect of which was statute barred, was effectively repeated without any further thought given to the matter in the second set. Now, the claim in respect of the second set of instructions in that case was perfectly permissible. But what of here, where we're dealing with further instructions in the same case, is the advice a new negligent act? And this comes back to what Elizabeth was suggesting. And the court was clear that that principle also applies here. So where on two or more occasions, the same or similar negligent advice is given, and there are two or more separate breaches of duty, because on each occasion when you advise, you've got to do it correctly. There's no general principle of logical common sense, which requires any sort of relation back, such as to say that the limitation was, period was triggered by the first occasion on which negligent advice was given, regardless of any subsequent breaches of duty. Now, that is subject to the caveat that sometimes the first negligent advice will set the claimant on a 
irretrievably on a course of conduct or commit them to a course of action, which means by the time the second negligent advice comes, it won't cause any further loss. But that's not a, a factor barring the, uh, the duty in respect of the second advice. It's just a, a point on loss. Now, this works well where you've got a series of acts and the negligence occurs on each time. But what of where there is a breach, which is statute barred, but the negligent advisor stays in post and then just carries on to fail to alert the claimant to the issues occasioned by that negligence? Well, conventionally, the law has not been kind uh, to claims based on con continuing duties, particularly in flawed transaction cases, nor does the court easily accede to the suggestion that damage isn't immediately suffered on the completion of a flawed transaction. And I think I'll skip over this slightly more briefly than I would otherwise have done, given um, the time constraints. Elliot and Hatton's, I, I've put on... Um, on the slide is, is a very recent Court of Appeal authority, which effectively confirms the existing jurisprudence laid down by the line of um, cases in Bell and Peter Brown and Co. and shows that clever factual arguments about damage not being applicable in this case because of certain sets of facts um, really won't pass muster because the test for whether the um, claimant receives less than they would have done had the advice been correct is an objective one. Um, it's quite a nice case because it looks at the distinction between truly contingent losses, uh, uh, contingent risk of harm, such as was suffered in law society in Sefton, as against flawed transaction cases where what you get as soon as the transaction is concluded is inherently less valuable, which completes your cause of action for the purposes of, of primary limitation. So in professional negligence claims relating to pension schemes, we're very often concerned with historic mistakes, which have lain undiscovered for years. One of the classic errors in pensions cases is claims relating to the steps taken, or more commonly not taken, by advisors to equalise following Barber. But Barber was decided on the 17th of May 1990. That's 31 years, or if you look at it another way, to section 14b long stops plus a little bit of change. Um, how can we now make claims in relation to losses that probably occurred in the mid to late 90s? Well, this is where Minkoff claims come in, also known as secondary or Russian doll claims. A Minkoff claim, named for the decision of Mr Justice Newberger, as he then was, in gold and Minkoff science in gold, is based on the principle that a professional may at some point come under a duty to advise his client of his own or, a fortiori, his predecessor's negligence. The Minkoff case itself related to Mr. Gold suing his former solicitors for an indemnity in a mortgage deed he'd signed, um, which had covered his business partner's debts, but not just the business partner's debts referable to their partnership, but all his personal debts owed to the bank. Now, there have been a whole series of mortgages executed between 1984 and 1990, which contained this clause. There was then a further mortgage entered into in 1993, which also claimed contained the clause, and again, the solicitors didn't draw it to his attention. The solicitors conceded negligence, but took the view there was no new harm uh, when they failed to advise Mr. Gold in 1993 of the onerous clause, because he was already liable under all the early, earlier mortgages, so where was the loss? Now, Mr. Justice Newberger found for Mr. Gold on both Section 14A and Section 32 of the Limitation Act, but crucially for present purposes, he also said that there would have been a loss of a chance to claim in respect of earlier negligence arising from the failure to draw the onerous clause to Mr. Gold's attention in 1993, because had they done so, he'd have thought, hang on, I didn't know that was there, investigated the earlier advice he'd received and possibly brought a claim within time. Now, this approach, being able to point to a second act of negligence and say, well, you ought to have told me about the earlier act of negligence, on that occasion is very useful in pension claims as a neat sidestep around having to make a claim based on continuing duty, which the court really doesn't like. And the opportunities to deploy a Minkoff claim come up fairly frequently because it's one of the most, one of, one of the most common occasions on which errors can and should be spotted. It's probably fair to say all should be spotted, um, is when drafting a new consolidated deed and rules, or even sometimes just a deed of amendment. A necessary part of the task in drafting a deed is going to involve the draftsman researching the history of the scheme so as to take reasonable steps to satisfy themselves, for example, as to the scheme's benefit structure. And during that process, the previous error, whether it be their own or someone else's, will, or at least should, come to the attention of the professional. If an error is there and either spotted and not raised with the client or not spotted when it should have been, 
the client's going to potentially have a loss of a chance claim against the advisor if, for example, the failure to notify the client of the error causes the past claim to come, become statute barred in circumstances where the, the, the client can demonstrate that they would have taken action against the original negligent professional. Now, this isn't going to be limited to pension schemes. It could theoretically apply to any occasion where in order to properly discharge your duty of care in relation to a client, you need to go back over historic matters, which should bring the claim to light. So assuming you get that far, how are we going to value your loss of a chance claim and what do you need to prove? Now, the leading authority on what needs to be proven is Allied Maples Group and Simmons and & Simmons. Uh, Simmons & Simmons were acting for the Allied Maples Group on a takeover of four department stores. And owing to restrictions in the covenants in the leases of those department stores, it need to needed to proceed by way of a share purchase agreement. So Allied Maples would effectively become the existing tenants shareholder. And the initial draft of that share purchase agreement contained a warranty regarding the vendor's liabilities, both existing and contingent. Negotiations watered that down, but this wasn't brought to Allied Maples' attention, to a clause which didn't cover contingent liabilities. And it was contingent liabilities that arose about a year after completion, leaving Allied, Ma Allied Maples uncovered by the contract. So they sued their solicitors. Now, I set out on the slide the principles that emerged from this case, but they were very neatly summarised in paragraph 20 of the Supreme Court's decision in Perry and Rayleigh's in 2019, which was a solicitor's negligence case relating to vibration white finger claims. And they said, for present purposes, the court have developed a clear and common sense dividing line between those matters which the client must prove and those which may better be assessed upon the basis of evaluation of a lost chance. To the extent, if at all, that the question the, whether the client would have been better off depends on what the client would have done on receipt of the competent advice. So this is effectively your counterfactual. This must be proved by the claimant on the balance of probabilities. To the extent that the supposed beneficial outcome depends on what others would have done, this depends on a loss of a chance evaluation. So in very summary terms, when you're looking at what the counterfactual position would have been had no negligence occurred, had the claimant received competent advice, the claimant needs to positively demonstrate on the balance of probabilities what steps they would have taken had they been competently advised. But where that requires the involvement of third parties, third parties taking steps, so long as there's a non-negligible chance that a third party would have taken a given step, what has been lost is the Y percent probability that the third party would have done X. And because the question of what the claimant would have done on the balance of probabilities is basically a threshold, a gateway to them then fully recovering, um, the court is entitled to, to look at that quite forensically and, and almost conduct a trial within a trial. That's clear from Perry and Rayleigh's. Now, bringing it back to pension schemes in a Minkoff Russian doll type claim in a pension case, it will be necessary for the claimant to overcome the first part of that test, what would we have done, by demonstrating on the balance of probabilities that a claim would probably have, been, well, not probably, would have been brought against the originally neg negligent professional. And this can lead to really interesting factual queries because you're looking back in time. What was the amount at stake valued at the hypothetical claim date? How litigious were the employers and trustees at the time? Would they have litigated as a matter of principle, irrespective of the funding position of the scheme, for example? How solvent were the employers? Could they have risked starting litigation, which they might lose? Were there any factors relating to the relationship with the advisors, which have, would have made litigation against them unattractive? Were they advisors for a very large group with very established relationships? Perhaps there were solvency concerns. Although, as Elizabeth noted in her talk, professional advisors usually are required to have, well, are required to have that professional indemnity insurance. So solvency isn't necessarily going to be a factor. Once you've demonstrated that the employers and or trustees would have litigated, then you get to look at the prospects of success had a claim been brought against the advisors around the time of the second negligent act. And again, there's some very interesting issues. A lot of them you need an actuary for, not a lawyer, I should say. Um, I, the lawyer can help with what the prevailing state of the law was at the time, what the recoverable loss should have been will be very much the province of the actuary because you'll need to look at what the funding base of the scheme was at the time what the investment returns were likely to be what the historic actuarial factors applying to valuing any loss would have been 
And then there's all sorts of interesting questions about how to adjust the value received in this hypothetical action. Do you get the notional claim that you would have got with interest added on for all those many years uh, after? Or do you ask for investment ret returns by actual lived scheme experience? Because so few of these cases actually go all the way through to trial, it's all a bit of a, a open season in the arguments that can be deployed. But before you get to be thinking about the returns you're getting on your notional proceed you've got to work out what your loss of a chance was you've got to value it and so we'll come to the last case I want to talk about asset co which came before the court of appeal last year I've set out the slide on the slide uh, briefly the facts uh, relating to this case effectively two members of senior management of asset co provided false statements and false documents to Grant Thornton who in reliance on those without uh, more gave clean audits for 2009 and 2010 now eventually the truth came out, but no thanks to the audits. Um, new management came in, restructured. There was a scheme of arrangements with creditors uh, in 2011. However, Asset Co claimed for various things that they said would not have happened had the true position been clear. Um, as you can see, they went for damages um, in excess of 31 million. Now, the first thing to say was this was a huge case. It generated a 318 page judgment and then a, a sort of side project judgment about the uh, appropriate level of contributory negligence discount. There was a 10 stage counterfactual that the court had to decide on. Um, I won't go through the steps in detail, but they went right through from discovery of the error, installation of new management, neutralizing the roles of the former dishonest management, accommodation with shareholders, standstill agreements with contract holders, staving off insolvency proceedings and the scheme of arrangement. And there was a general finding at first instance that Asset Co would have, would have successfully completed their scheme of arrangement and restructuring in 2009. Uh, Mr. Justice Bryan, in finding this, found that Asset Co had established this on the balance of probabilities, as it had to do under the Allied Maples Doctrine. And he also found, and this was the point of the appeal, that the chances of the third parties doing what was necessary for this purpose were in each case either 100% or so high that they fell to be treated as 100%. So he didn't discount the amount awarded as damages at all to take into account the chance that the restructuring wouldn't have occurred. Um, now, there were three grounds of appeal, and you'll be pleased to hear I was a, I'm was i only interested in the one I've put in bold typeface on the slide. Um, looking at that in a little more detail, the second limb of the appeal related to specific percentage chances attributed to various contingencies, and I, I'm not going to take you through that because of time. The first limb is, is what we really need to focus on because issue was taken with the judge's decision to take take each contingency in the in the 10 stage step as a certainty. It was said that where he had found as a matter of uh, evaluation in the judgment that the prospects of something were not less than 90 percent, he should have used the figure of 90 percent, not then rounded up to 100. It was also said that when putting the effects of each contingency together and truly calculating the, the prospects, the loss the last chance, those contingencies as percentages ought to have been multiplied together in order to find the overall chance of success of the scheme of arrangement occurring in 2009. Um, before we get into the final point on, on maths, um, the slide, the next slide sets out the general reluctance of the Court of Appeal um, to interfere with trial judges' evaluations in cases where the counterfactual is fact heavy. Um, the court gave a fairly exhaustive list of reasons as to why the first instance judge is best placed to determine these matters. Um, and some of the uh, extracts from this decision between paragraph 151 and 157 are really nice to have in your back pocket if you're subject to an appeal involving uh, evaluation of loss of a chance, because they really do make clear that the trial judge is really best placed to deal with it. So finally, what's the correct mathematical approach to uh, a loss of a chance claim? It was accepted at the trial that in a series of totally independent factors, this, it is appropriate or can be a, permissible to use a strictly mathematical approach where you take X percent of chance of A happening and times it by the Y percent chance of B happening until you apply a compounded percentage to reach the possibility uh, uh, as, a, as a proper percentage and you then apply that final percentage to the damages claimed. However, the case which is authority for the fact that one can do that in truly independent cases 
is also authority for the fact that things rarely are truly independent. And where there is overlap or dependence, then the compounding mathematical approach will be incorrect. Now, these propositions, as I say, were both accepted by the parties at the end of trial. The question was really whether the judge was entitled to round up these 90 percent or things that had not less than 90 percent prospects of success and treat them as 100 percent. Now, the Court of Appeal found, looking at the interrelatedness of the contingencies in the 10 stage counterfactual, that there were effectively four independent contingencies here. And it was alleged that those ought to have been assessed appropriately and then the mathematical approach applied. But the court didn't agree that the at least 90 percent possibility should be assessed at 90 percent. I've set out the quote and um, the bottom quote on the slide from paragraph 206 of the judgment. And one factor that had led the judge to take these at least 90 percent possibilities as racing certainties, as he called them, was the fact that the judge heard witnesses from the third parties who would have been involved in the counterfactual. And the judge had a real life demonstration of the counterfactual actually working in the form of what happened two years later in 2011. And it was these points that informed the Court of Appeals judgment that the proper analysis of the judge's reasoning is that he was satisfied that the chances of each contingency were so high that they fell to be regarded as certainties, not because of a principle or presumption that 90% equals 100%, but because a distinction between certain and almost certain was in this case meaningless. And they concluded that that was open to the judge, both as a matter of principle and on the authorities. So this case provides really helpful guidance and a useful reference point for the sort of the case law on whether one can do a, a ruthlessly mathematical approach or it needs to be a more nuanced evaluation. But I think the take home from this case is that it betrays how fact specific these matters are. So really get them right at first instance and you shouldn't go too far wrong. Thank you, Wendy, for that. And thank you all those who have been listening. Uh, I congratulate you for not having asked any questions in the Q&A. And I think in view of the time, uh, we perhaps won't stop to take questions now, but will say that if anybody does have questions arising from this webinar, um, you will be able to find us very easily through Radcliffe Chambers website if you don't already have our email addresses. So thank you again to everybody. And uh, we hope you've found some useful points in this webinar. Thank you.